the last political education webinar of the year. Um, it's on abolitionist democracy and we're super excited. We have the fire, <laughs> the most incredible panel I think we've had um, and just a really amazing lineup of folks to talk to us and think with us about what it means to be abolitionist in this moment, to engage with um, and also to try and transform the institutions that underlie all quote unquote democracy. And so we're super excited and super blessed. We're actually gonna start, I think, um, with a quick exploration into what we mean by abolitionist democracy. And so um, a quick slideshow, a quick kind of dive into both the Du Boisian and the Angela Davis versions of what this actually is, what we're talking about here. And then we have the most esteemed, the most fiery, the most dope, the most gem drop in panel um, that I could ever dream of or imagine, who will really kind of close us out and talk to us about what this means for them, their organizing and their thinking. And so y'all are blessed. I feel super, super excited to have um, these folks on the call. And we also have an incredible audience of folks. So we really want to encourage you throughout the conversation um, to participate via the chat box. And we will hopefully have time at the end to also open up to some questions, um, but really invite you to put your questions, your thoughts, um, your interventions inside of the chat box for us so we can learn from each other. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen really quick um, to just kind of walk us through how um, Alphabio came to this webinar um, in our own kind of journey of exploration and political shopping that we've been engaged in. Let's see if I can get the tech down. Um, can everyone see that screen okay? Dope, I think. Um, so we are talking there we go, present. Um, so today we're talking about abolitionist democracy and we're thinking about that as a, oh, it wants me to pay something. There we go. Um, as kind of how we can think about transforming democratic institutions that are anti-Black and anti-democratic at the core. And so for us, you know, L4BL um, has been engaged and remains engaged in trying to constantly sharpen our politics. Um, and we've been trying to gather the lessons from what's been an incredibly difficult year, whether it's the pandemic, the uprising this summer or the elections most recently, and kind of trying to make sense of how all of those things are connected and how all of them are rooted in our politics. And so both the staff, our core members, membership and our partners have been in kind of constant conversation about what do these elections mean for how we engage as abolitionists, as radical thinkers, as radical lawyers, how do we engage in the 2020 elections, how do we think about the elections as part of a larger abolitionist project that we're engaged in. And so we've been really kind of pushing ourselves to understand and to gather the kind of multiplicity and the layers of lessons. And so we've been asking ourselves, how can we understand the kind of democratic system we find ourselves inside of? And how how do we mitigate the harm um, and the threat that it really poses to our people while also keeping our eyes on transformation and so not becoming complicit in it, um, not lending legitimacy to it. So how do we both hold what we see as a radical politic um, inside of kind of this democratic quote unquote system and more, more I think specifically inside of an electoral kind of moment. Um, we also have been asking ourselves, what is the relationship between the election and our engagement with the election um, and abolitionist politics more generally? And so we at L4BL, I think folks who follow us know this, consider ourselves abolitionists. Um, when we say that, we mean abolition of the prison industrial complex. And so we are borrowing this definition from critical resistance, who is um, one of the kind of thought leaders in the field who has taught us so much that um, PIC or prison industrial complex abolition means it's a political vision with the goal of eliminating imprisonment, policing and surveillance and creating lasting alternatives to punishment and imprisonment. And so clearly these have this idea of eliminating the cost of state um, and all of its offshoots has real implications for democratic institutions. But I think we at L4BL have been trying to figure out what is our abolitionist kind of politic mean for how we engage um, in the kind of democratic democracy election work that has been so prominent because it's been such a threat to our people um, in this year specifically. And so many of us have the kind of lived experience of our democracy as exclusionary, as elitist, as anti-Black, as anti-woman. Um, and much of this comes from kind of long histories of voter suppression, of the ways these institutions are often incredibly violent against Black bodies, against femme bodies. Um, and so whether it's poor taxes, whether it's kind of the, um, the binging of voter rolls that we saw in Georgia, um, 
during Stacey Abrams election or even not allowing incarcerated folks or system involved folks to vote. There are all of these ways in which we can see um, that our democracy like strives to exclude people. But I think this election and all of the kind of talk around um, a, a possible coup by Trump and the ways in which the kind of the whole electoral system was really called into question um, via the ways in which Trump showed up for this election also made us do a deeper examination into the ways in which the kind of syst the systems of our democracy, the institutions of our democracy are also deeply racist. And this is not a surprise to us. Um, I'm sure it's not a surprise to you either, but it feels important to really name that. That it's not just that kind of the rules of play or the rules of the game are discriminatory. It's that actually every single institution in our democracy was built um, and was created to maintain the power of white slave owners and to suppress and to oppress black bodies and black vo voices and black votes. And so we really spent, I think, some time um, thinking about and looking at Du Bois's writing to think about how, in fact, the kind of founding of our country and our institutions really have been deeply, deeply anti-Black, anti and how that plays out in the ways in which the Senate, the Electoral College, the Supreme Court, how all these institutions remain anti-Black um, and anti-democratic in some kind of basic ways. And so, as many of us know, all of our institutions and our democracy in quotes, um, its foundations was all kind of a forged compromise between white male slave owners um, and landowners in the South and rich white landowners in the North. And so we know that the beginnings of our kind of country, the creation of the Senate, the creation of the Electoral College, all of these institutions were actually built and created to delude the popular vote in some ways, to delude the power of kind of masses and to ensure that rich white men, whether they owned slaves or not, uh, maintained both their privilege and their power through the kind of guise of democracy, right? And so I think we know those roots, but I don't think we often think about what that actually means for the kind of functioning of our democracy in the every single day. And so, you know, when we think about kind of the major institutions that are kind of the foundations of our democracy, like the Senate, we recognize for, um, for instance, that the Senate, really the idea of having two different senators from every single state, no matter the size, was really part of the ways that white Southern landowners were able to maintain their power. Because as we know, at kind of during that time, the South and the North had about equivalent populations, but one thing of the South population were Black folks who were enslaved. And so a popular vote, a kind of one person, one vote, would clearly disservice the South who was trying to really um, suppress the Black vote during that time. Um, and so to maintain, to ensure that kind of white slave owners in the South could maintain their power, the Senate allowed two representatives from every single state, no matter the size. And we know that now the result of that is the overrepresentation of the white vote across the country. And so for instance, we know that the roughly 2.7 million people who live in Wyoming, Vermont, Alaska, Alaska and North Dakota have the same number of senators who represent 110 million people in California, Texas, Florida, and New York, which of course are much more diverse states. And so we see the way in which the inflation of the privilege, uh, privileging of the white vote continues via the Senate. Um, and we also have the filibuster, which is a practice that really was introduced and used throughout the civil rights era to, um, to refuse kind of progress around civil rights legislation, also stops any major changes, whether that is a kind of a rethink thinking of the Supreme Court, whether that is statehood for DC or Puerto Rico, um, that any major changes are, are stopped by this conservative body that is already kind of stacked in favor of white underpopulated states across the country. We know that there's a similar story of origin for the Electoral College that kind of white Southern uh, slave owners and landowners feared that their votes would be depleted by a kind of one person, one vote system and so created a non-direct democracy to allow their votes to be overcounted. And we know that that is still in fact the case. That the Electoral College, which was meant as a compromise to preserve white slave owners' power, continues to dilute Black voices and votes throughout the South by the kind of winner-take-all system that privileges smaller states yet again. And so although one-fourth of Black folks in this country live in the South, their votes are deeply diluted by the Electoral College itself and by the kind of system that was set up to again protect white privilege um, at the founding of our country. And so I think for us, this idea that not only is the cost of a state, which we all are fighting against and are familiar with being deeply, deeply rooted in racism um, and slavery, that also our democratic institutions, our Senate, our electoral college, um, the foundations of our quote unquote democracy are also like the cost of state deeply rooted inside of slavery and anti-blackness. And so we were really interested in what this meant for our activism, what this meant for our visions of liberation. And so really went back to the writings and thinkings of W.E.D. Du Bois who came up 
up with this idea of, of abolition democracy, which we know for Angela Davis's writing, who is an abolitionist of the PIC, who we admire deeply, is different and distinct from PIC abolition, but is deeply related. And so what um, Du Bois said is that abolition democracy is the idea that to realize true abolition, the end of real slavery in all of its forms and all of its offshoots and all of its afterlife, that we must remake nearly every single institution in American society. And that includes the electoral system. It's not just the cultural system that has spread or come up from slavery, but it is also all of the democratic institutions that really were rooted in and were the result of compromises around slavery, around maintaining the institution of slavery and anti-Blackness. Angela Davis, nearly 80 years later, really um, popularizes this term and talks about the ways in which abolition democracy is linked to and related to prison industrial complex democracy and how a real abolitionist vision includes a much wider purview of things we must destroy and also remake. And so Angela Davis explains to us that Du Bois argued that the abolition of slavery was ac accomplished only in the negative sense. In order to achieve the comprehensive abolition of slavery, new institutions should have been created to incorporate Black people into the social order. Slavery could not be truly abolished until people were provided with the economic means for the substance. They also needed access to claim voting and other political rights. Du Bois essentially argues that a host of democratic institutions are needed to, to fully achieve abolition, thus abolitionist democracy. And so thinking through what is the full range of institutions, of the electoral, of the cultural state, of the education apparatus that must be remade in an image to actually necessitate the freedom and abolition for all Black folks um, and for freedom. And this is a quote from uh, Lego McLeod, who we um, really admire, whole kind of writings on abolition, who talks about Du Bois and abolition as well. And she says, according to Du Bois, to be meaningful, abolition requires more than simply a direct eradication of slavery. Du Bois wrote that simple, simply declaring an end to the tradition of violent forced labor was insufficient to abolish slavery. Abolition instead required the creation of new democratic forms in which the institutions and ideas previously implicated in slavery would be remade to incorporate those persons formerly enslaved. To be meaningful, the abolition of slavery required fundamentally reconstructing social economics and political arrangements. And so it's from this idea around how do we actually get at um, a transformation of systems that isn't just the cost of state, but is the electoral state that changes every single relationship, every single um, arrangement of the social, of the cultural, of the political life of this country to truly realize abolition, that we come to this panel. And we have an incredible um, kind of lineup of folks who are doing work both in inside the electoral system, inside of the kind of abolition of the prison industrial complex, um, but have a vision about how do we mitigate immediate harm while also thinking about this idea of transforming relationships and of remaking institutions. And so we're super excited um, and I'm incredibly humbled to call all of these folks comrades and friends to heal from Tracy, Ashley um, Woodward Henderson, Tenjiwe McHarris, Amna Akbar and Kumar Rao to hear their thoughts on what it looks like to actually kind of remake society, remake relationships and to honor a vision of full abolition of not just the prison industrial complex, but also one that addresses electoral politics and beyond. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and just mad props to me because that was exactly 10 minutes and that really happened. So shout out to me on the timeliness. Um, but I wanna just kind of jump right into the questions, which is, you know, kind of hearing this presentation and thinking about what abolitionist democracy might mean to you. I'm curious, what all kind of other ways that US institutions, besides just the kind of police and the, the cost of state, which we often talk about as being corrupt and anti-Black, what are the ways kind of other US institutions are also deeply anti-Black? Um, what does that look like and kind of what are the implications of those um, institutions being anti-Black and elitist. And I'll throw it to whoever wants to start us off. Um, it's Tracy, I can start off. Um, I say this all the time, but all of our institutions are anti-Black. They're all rooted in anti-Black racism. Um, and so I remember a couple uh, months ago, I was asked, um, could housing be looked at as a form of reparations? And I was like, okay, but you have to actually name the harm that you're talking about because reparations for what? Are we talking about reparations for slavery? Are we talking about reparations for sharecropping? Are we talking about reparations for the, you can look up and down the lynching trails and see white people trying to get their land back. So are we talking about reparations for that? Are we talking about for redlining? Are we talking about reparations for um, the predatory litty that led to the 20, 2008 housing crisis? So all of that was like involved in anti-Black racism. And you're even looking right now, we are coming up on an eviction crisis that is anti-Black. 
And so if we're gonna talk about repair, we have to actually name the harm that we wanna repair for. So when we talk about like, what are, what are systems outside of um, policing? I really think about policing being intertwined with our systems like DNA. Um, my colleague and comrade Alex always talks about police being the muscle of racial capitalism. Um, so you think about a, a mom, right? A black mom who has like these barriers to healthcare who might not be able to get her child vaccinated. And that means that she can't send her child to public school. And that means now she becomes criminalized for not being able to send her kid to public school in the same way like a white mom in Southern California can like join a social club for not being able to vaccinate her child because she has the wealth and the means to privately educate them. So I think when we talk about um, criminalizing folks, when we talk about all of these systems, we have to think about the way that they are designed and intertwined to criminalize black people um, and that like all of it is rooted in anti-black racism. Gems, I told you I didn't know gems. Thank you so much for that, Tracy, and for kind of the zoom out for us. Um, anyone else want to talk about kind of other institutions that y'all see and just one of the ways in which they are also anti-Black and elite? I can chime in a little bit. Um, so I think like, I know you said don't focus on policing and courts, but I think it's really important to kind of think about how one of the things that's happened in the 20th century and um, reports that Law for Black Lives and BYP 100 and CPD, Center for Popular Democracy have written have documented this, organized around the country have shown us this, the way that um, you know, one of the main kind of developments of the 20th century is the funding of police and prisons over any other form of social and public goods, whether that's housing um, or healthcare or anything else. And so the, um, you know, and so the very shape of the state, right? Like when you think about democracy in the narrow sense that we tend to think of it in the United States in terms of inputs about the shape of the state, the shape of the state is so centrally defined by prisons and police that have their root, you know, that have, that have their, um, uh, you know, come from the histories of enslavement and colonialism. And so I think, and they're also, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore and others have written about, deeply entangled with even the limited forms of social provision we have, whether that's public housing or food stamps um, and so on. And so you can't separate um, police and the courts from the broad, broader shape of the US government, including the child separation system. I saw that someone was asking about that in the chat. Um, and the other thing I've been thinking a lot about I don't have very much to say about it other than it's just a basic observation. So when you think of our court system, I mean, the largest footprint, and I'm not sure if this is empirically true, so I want to I want to look into this more, but the largest part, you know, it's like evictions, deportations, sending people to prison and jail. Um, and so that is the, you know, that, that gets you not just like the state violence part, right? So like the deportation, incarceration, prosecution, detention, but it also gets you into how the state is very, deeply implicated in um, you know, extracting things from people, not guaranteeing housing. Um, and so um, you know, the, the court system is deeply entangled in creating the society that benefits very few and that you know, really leads to um, increasingly unsurvivable uh, situation for so many Americans, including in particular black and brown communities. Um, I will stop there. Thank you. I think that's a really important point that kind of understanding them not as separate, but as deeply intertwined, that the police state, the coastal state was created as anti-Black in coordination with and deeply entwined with these kind of quote unquote democratic institutions as well. Thank you so much for that, Amna. Anyone else want to kind of weigh in on this idea of like, all, like pick, <laughs> pick an institution, how is a racist uh, game we're playing right now? Um, I can, I, oh, go ahead. Oh. Hey, sure, no, I can go after you, Kamar. Okay, um, well, I was just gonna um, kind of talk about two like big picture uh, questions around this. Um, and I sort of maybe call them the two C's, right? The con like the constitution and capitalism, right? So at the core of the United States is both of these institutions, um, which is, you know, our form of governance and our form of uh, sort of social, uh, construction and our economic system and that their core both of them are very much um, definitionally anti-black right they uh, originated in a time when you know the, the core economic function of the state was to facilitate the uh, institution of human chattel slavery um, anti-black chattel slavery and so um, 
what we see today is obviously a continuation and an extension really of that same system. Um, and so when we talk about, you know, all the systems being implicated by anti-Black racism, that's not hyperbole. That is very much a reality and an extension of our origins as a nation. Um, and, you know, I think important to note that we've never altered from that. You know, we, we had a, obviously there was a civil war, um, I think in other, in other places when you have that kind of fracture, um, you start anew, right? Um, you build anew with a new constitution, a new system of economics, a new system of governance, a new system of actual democracy. We never had that. Um, we got one uh, amendment to the constitution, which actually allowed for a, um, you know, allowed for slavery under certain circumstances, didn't even abolish it. So um, I think, you know, the constitution uh, and the, our capitalist system kind of being at their core anti-Black um, is why today we see, you know, every system as Tracy laid out, sort of uh, being infected with this um, anti-Black racism. And, and so I, I would totally uh, just name, right, our education system, our media and entertainment system, our um, healthcare system. Our, I mean, literally our entire sort of way our society is structured um, is, you know, rotten um, with and rife with anti-Black racism um, because of its connections and extension to history. Thank you so much for that. And it feels important just to also name the ways in which I think capitalism is such a good thing to bring into this conversation because so many of these systems were also created to protect capitalism, right? And so we think about the ways in which, whether it's the Senate or the Electoral College, that's also about protecting white privilege, but also white wealth. And so really appreciate that perspective. And I want to just invite everyone, we're going to have some time at the very end to open it up for questions and comments, but want to invite everyone to be up in the chat box. Um, I think we're all kind of multitasking with the chat box. So if you have thoughts or comments um, or things you want want to add to the conversation, please do so. And we'll also uh, save some time today and to open it up to, to everyone on the call. So my next question is really about these elections and kind of what um, what was showcased, what was exposed by kind of this Trumpian era and this, this election. And I think for many folks who are not kind of all the way into these politics, all the way into, into this study, that this era, the last four years, um, and the way that Trump has, has navigated the presidency has shown kind of how precarious our democracy is. Um, and for folks who weren't already exposed to how exclusionary and how problematic it was, I think the fact that kind of this low key coup that still happened and the attempt just went to show kind of how deeply, deeply, deeply precarious and vulnerable our institutions were and how dependent they were upon kind of the goodwill and the like the willingness um, of a lot of privileged white men to adhere by a set of kind of rituals, right? And so I'm interested for y'all who have been organizing inside of this kind of Trumpian era, um, what these elections have meant, what has the last four years exposed about US institutions that has been kind of fought or for the organizing work you've done Done, what has it made possible? Um, and what are kind of some of your reflections on how you can organize and have chosen to organize around these elections? What are ways that you've engaged the elections um, to influence outcomes, but also to kind of have your eye on transforming these systems? Um, and anyone who's kind of been in the mix around the elections would love to hear your thoughts on how you've balanced those two things. Sure, I can start. Can y'all hear me? Great. Um, every time I get the question of, of what this election or even what this year has taught us, it's like, what, ha what has it in? Um, it's both like the longest and the, the year that um, just won't end. So, But, but uh, just, just a few things. Um, uh, and then I want to go back to something Kumar said that I thought was really important. But, but in terms of, I think, what, what the, this election and just this period, this era, the past four years, um, and uh, the 2020 election has, has exposed to us. The first thing I'm gonna say is, is, is I've, I've said in the past, I think Trump is a dangerous spectacle, but I do think that we get lost in the spectacle of Trump as opposed to the far right agenda that he has in some ways effectively executed, um, as well as the growing demand for Trump. And, um, and, I, and I think that we have to hold all of that. But, but, but what, what this election has exposed really obviously is the hypocrisy of American democracy, the illusion of American democracy, which is a really a front to the core principles um, of what de democracy is, is supposed to be um, and has existed, has always existed in this country. And so that's one. Two is obviously the cruelty of capitalism and the power of corporations. Um, uh, 
And third is, is sort of the depth of anti-Blackness in, in, in both rhetoric and in policy. Um, and you know, I think this period has exposed obviously the escalating threat that has not gone anywhere in terms of the rise of the far right. Um, you know, it's it's it, it's still here, but it's also um, just proven um, the 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 in effect the 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 challenge with uh, the neoliberal center and the democratic the democratic establishment. Um, and so it's exposed both, right? And and this whole idea of neoliberalism versus neo-fascism. Um, is a false sort of um, dichotomy. It's it's it, it, what it's proven is sort of the failures of neoliberalism to allow to allow us to get to a 2016 moment. Um, um, and then the last piece I'll just say, obviously, with with what's what's happened recently, is um, you know it's, it's continued to expose what we we've always known to be true, which is the democratic establishment has a long history of blaming black movement for its underperformance. And so while we have an eye towards the issue with the far right, we're also having to contend with the challenges of the center. But, but I think in terms of what this uh, moment is teaching us in terms of transformative, transform, transformational change um, and an organizing agenda, there's just like a few things and it goes to Kumar's point. It, it's, it's before, you know, as we talk about the abolition of the carceral state and transforming institutions, we, fir we first have to look at how, um, how uh, uh, so how the economy is designed and how the governing, how governance is designed in this country, because these are the two forces that essentially design, have designed and continue to control these institutions that we're trying to either abolish or transform. And so, so at the heart of it is we, we won't be able to abolish the, 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 anything from the death penalty to the police or transform our institutions in the way that we need to. Um, unless we actually deal with racial capitalism and the role of the state. I mean, I, sometimes I think we talk even more about the economy than the role of the state in terms of control of resources and, 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 and how we actually, how, you know, how we want to see governance happen in this country. So we have to deal with those core issues. And, and just as Du Bois and others have articulated um, decades ago, you know, we'll never, we'll never, we'll never truly end the enslavement of masses of people. We don't radically change, not just the institutions, but the economy. Um, and the governing structure um, that designs them. So anything short of that means a reproduction of one form of enslavement after uh, one form of enslavement for, for another. Um, and so, you know, I believe we need to move away from cap racial capitalism and bourgeois democracy towards solidarity economies and participatory democracy. And this means that the fundamental rights that people um, to need to survive, housing, healthcare, education, um, all of those things are not places to accumulate wealth, is not places to make profit, but they are free. They are the commons, they're public goods, and people have, have sort of access to it. And, and, and um, you know, the road towards that from my vantage point is around, obviously these are all long-term fights and, and, and soon. And, and I believe the road towards that is a few things. Obviously, I think we have to have um, big vision and, and be okay with demanding structural change. And I, and I also think now is the time that we have to demand uh, and fight over budgets, budgets at the local, state, and federal level. I think the, you know, the road towards change the economy, the road towards governing structure, for me, is paved by fighting for how money is spent in this country and why money is, is and how, how priorities are set based on how money, how dollars move. And so we, this is the moment where we, we have to forcefully reject um, uh, the, how billions of dollars are going to policing military and fossil fuels um, and make demands towards resources going to things from healthcare. Everybody should have healthcare. Everybody should have housing. Everybody should have free college. Everybody should have, you know, all, all these things. And I think it's our duty as organizers to, 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 these are common sense solutions to the crises of our times, um, as opposed to um, austerity and policing and militarism. Um, and and I'll just I'll just end by saying you know a few things are also true as we move towards this sort of more transformative uh, vision. Uh, some of the things I think we need to demand in, in this moment, obviously, is around budgets. As I said before, it's I also believe that we need to like ante up demands for pro uh, progressive restructuring of the tax codes and taxing both mega billionaires and billionaires. Um, uh, that we need to obviously fight for like more equity within different institutions from DOE to, to HUD, that we need to demand structural democracy form, that we need to popularize and end to everything from the filibuster to sort of the ways in which the Supreme Court is designed. And that we also need to cr help, help create pay, uh, ro uh, pathways um, towards uh, making possible a, a third party. Yes, preach.
um, I, <laughs> amens to all of that. And I think this idea around racialized capitalism as like what needs to be abolished feels so, so helpful as kind of a center of how we organize. Ashley, I'm, I'm interested because I feel like you were part of the front lines and thinking through how do we make electoral interventions in this moment as well, what you would add to kind of what Tinji Wei has shared around kind of what is opening what's possible in this moment. Yeah, I mean, I feel like hearing uh, my comrades speak, it, I wrote like a Christmas list of, 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 of things that I, that I think are important to, to add. Uh, I wanna start by saying that I think one of the biggest lessons that I hope folks learned in 2020 and in that four years of, of really even pr prior to 2016, when you know black women and Southerners and folks that actually talk to everyday people, working class folks, said that the election wasn't in the bag for Clinton um, and said that Trump was going to win. Um, and then, you know, reminded folks early and often that as goes the South, so goes the nation isn't, a, isn't an opinion, it's a fundamental fact. I hope by now we've proven it to be so. Uh, and not only just because, you know, Georgia's going blue and, you know, all of, all of the real stories of the fact that the abolitionist movement wouldn't exist had it not been for a Southern freedom movement that's centuries old and a black liberation movement that didn't start in New York or California, but like, and no shade to those of you that are from New York and California, it's just true. Um, but like very literally Washington DC is below the Mason Dixon line. So what happens in the South impacts the rest of the country. So I, I would start there. <laughs> I would be remiss to not to not shout out all of you who are Southern and, and doing the damn thing in impossible circumstances uh, to get us to where we are. Um, and I think we also learned that trusting black women is a practice, not just a hashtag, right? The people that listen to Tracy <laughs> won elections, <laughs> right? Like just very, it's very simple. Um, so, you know, I think sometimes we, we what, what I hope we learned in, in the last four years is that we make like rock, finger painting into rocket science around what we should be doing when really concretely what we should be doing is following the leadership of this black led multiracial working class united front that's been built. I think what we learned in the last four years is that silos suck. They don't win, right? Um, and that what we need is to be working together in that united front. I think what we learned is that there is not enough infrastructure to support the amount of movement lawyering that is necessary for us to be able to win and win unabashedly and then to sustain those wins. And I think that the work that Mabre and you all with the, with the Law for Black Lives crew have been doing is actually literally life-saving for those of us that don't live in places where there are critical masses of, of lefty attorneys. I think that we learn that neoliberalism kills too. I think Tenji spoke to it. Uh, I think that we learned that there's no such thing as neutrality, right? Uh, the founder of the place that I get to steward, the Highlander Research and Education Centers, Miles Horton used to say, you can't be neutral on a moving train. And it is very clear that the train is out of the gate. So what we learned, I think in an electoral context is that people like, you know, I think Tenji spoke to this too, as much as we are the movement for black lives, those of us that are involved in are gonna be blamed for where Democrats didn't pick up seats. The reality is that most of those people didn't pick up their seats and win because they tried to play to the center. They didn't run on anything that was connected to the values of the vast majority of those of us living in this country, but the people that ran on the platforms that were rooted in our values, right? Folks that came from our social movements tended to win or lose by really tiny proportions that show that we're building power. Um, so I would say what we learned is that there's no such thing as neutrality. You are either on the side of bending the moral arc of the universe towards justice or you aren't. And you are literally pulling the, by, your, by your, complicit, your complicity, you're pulling the moral arc of the universe towards injustice. I think a couple of more things that I would say is that, you, you know, the, the state will use white supremacist violence, even if they say they didn't have anything to do with it, to further criminalize and prosecute and investigate those of us that are on the side of, of liberation and justice for all, right? I think a concrete example of that was the many, many, many folks in Muslim communities who were attacked by white supremacists, the many, many, many black communities and black institutions that were attacked by white supremacists, including the Highlander Center, who then were investigated by the feds around like, what was your participation in making this happen? Who donated to you? Who are you training or supporting, right? And so I think it's also something to pay attention to because we have not yet seen what the backlash will be for the victories that we've won in 2020. 
I think the last thing that I would say in, in regards to some of the things that I've, I've learned in 2020 is that we can build policy by and for regular people, right? The vision for Black Lives is a perfect example of that. Although we had many, many incredible policy wonks who I love and adore that helped us to, to actualize that document. The demands were from everyday people on the ground. The Breathe Act is another example of that. It was literally our, our love letter back, our legislative love letter back to people who were in the streets demanding defund the police, right? And, and it wasn't to shift from protest to policy. It what we, you saw in terms of the fight for electoral justice in this country this year was not a shift from protest to electoral work. What you saw is that we knew that we could walk and chew gum at the same time, that it is anti-Black and it is classist and it is ableist to believe that we could not have a multi-tactical strategy for the liberation of Black people that there in, in, in result liberates everybody because we know that if it's good for Black people, it's good for everybody. So what I learned about elections is that we, when my ancestors said, by any means necessary, they met by all the means and we practiced it in 2020. And we saw that for having folks that were experts at direct action, experts at policy, experts at organizing and base building, experts at movement lawyering and litigation, experts at electoral work and experts in political education and popular education all coming together across our different tactical expertise to develop a multi-tactical strategy actually got the goods, right? And I think that's the story of 2020 is that we were not, we did all of that, not because we believed that the Biden and Harris administration were gonna be a great savior to the black people or that they were gonna save working families. We know better. We know that we're still gonna have to lean in and be the outside pressure on their necks, right? There's no question that now is not the time to just be in relief. Now is the time to also push for more reform. I think what we learned is that Though coming together across that and using all of those powerful tactical interventions actually would get us the goods. I think what we learned is that when we demand what we deserve, not just what we would concede to, we actually can fool around and get it, right? We actually have the power to do it. And, and we learn that when we do that in ways that don't concede territory or tactics, whether the territory is rural folks or faith folks or working class folks, folks that we sometimes don't agree with or wanna be around. But if we come together across our petty differences or identity differences, not, not dismissing our identity differences or, or any of that, but coming together across of them anyway, um, in this multi tactical strategy that's black led, we can, we can win. I think that's what we learned in 2020. Yes. Yes, this idea that neoliberalism kills, I felt like is a bookmark because I feel like some of the distraction of the spectacle, as you said, um, Tinjiwe, of the Trump era is that we forget <laughs> about our neoliberal brethren who are also trying to kill us and what that looks like. And so the organizing you talk about, Ashley, I think is so clearly um, creating power to fight both of those battles. Um, and I really appreciate that. Uh, Tracy, do you want to talk a bit about the work that you've done um, and how you also kind of what the lessons of learned from the last four years have been and beyond that? Sure. Um, I just remember when this election, uh, the primary kicked off, I said to Kumar, I said, I really don't want to vo vote for the author of the 94 crime bill. And I really don't want to vote for a cop. And what we ended up having <laughs> was that is the ticket. <laughs> and so um, I think I said that to you too, Marbre. Um, and so for me, I learned um, both the limitations and the expansive power of our movement. Um, I learned that there is um, no middle ground, that we have to go all in because the other side does. And so there is this like placating where people want to say, let's get back to normal, uh, but normal was killing us. And so for me, I learned that there's no reason for us to pretend like we're trying to do that. Um, and I learned that we're winning. One of the things that you saw immediately after Black people won this election was folks trying to say that our demand lost it. And so for me, for me, I looked at that and said, oh, they're really scared of us because we are showing up everywhere they are. It used to be they saw us as being people who were unorganized or who didn't know. And that was never true, but that was the way they saw us. And now we're running up in their budget meetings. 
Um, we know we know about the meeting before the meeting. We're not just showing up to city councils. We're not just showing up um, to testify. We actually know people in the offices. We're making the same power moves that they've been making all this time. And so they're scared. Um, we saw earlier today, there was something that was dropped that Joe Biden was talking to black elders about how they should like show up in the work they and what they should and shouldn't say and what they should and shouldn't stand for. And it's because they know that when we come together, our collective power will win. And so I, I am continuing to learn. I'm continuing to look to folks on this call. I'm continuing to learn um, from folks on this call um, what it means to be bold and to actually stand in the vision um, and to not back back up and to make make demands that are based in our value, not based in what we think we can win. Um, I was working with a group of young people and they were like, oh, we want a 2% decrease of suspensions. But I'm like, that's, that's what grown people told you you could win. That's not what you want. And they said, okay, we actually don't want any police in our schools. And this year, those group of young people won police-free schools, right? Or So it is, if, if we stand in our way and we say, okay, well, the powers that be said that this is all we can do, then that's all we're going to get. But we have to be visionary. We have to be impactful in our demands because that's what people are asking for. Um, and we have to also remember that things are a struggle. Like this is a struggle. Years ago, when we started doing fast food strikes and people said 15 in a union, folks in our own community said, ain't nobody uh, gonna get pay a McDonald's worker $15. And now we know that all work deserves dignity and we're gonna pay McDonald's workers and hospital workers and everybody else what they are or what they deserve. Um, and so as I'm organizing, I'm continuing to remind people that it's not about a candidate. Um, None of these candidates, I hate to say it, are our friends. As a matter of fact, we are electing our targets. Um, and it's easy. I, I know that there are certain elected officials who I look at their Twitter presence or their presence on TV and I like them too. But at the same time, they are working to fit within an anti-Black power structure. Even your fave is within an anti-Black power structure. And so they have to make compromises, compromises within that structure that are not our compromises. And so we have to stay on their neck to make sure that they know that we're watching that and that's not okay. Um, and, and, and I think Ashley said this perfectly, like we know these people aren't gonna save us. They never have been for us. They were never going to save us. And so, we are not joining the movement of elected officials. We are not um, joining any party that they are leading. They are the vehicles for our demands. And so we have to remember that these are people that we elected to do our work and not people who we are organizing around their agendas. Thank you. I feel like all of those answers are so powerful for me because I think that I'm somebody, I'm going to just be 100, who was hesitant to get involved in organizing around the election because I have this sense of how do we engage in a way that doesn't legitimize these institutions. It doesn't, doesn't like kind of have us fanboying or dollaring kind of candidates as the answer as opposed to actually kind of building power. And I think it really is the work that y'all have been leading, the interventions you've made that have really shown us that there are ways to engage this system while being really clear on the ways the system is deeply corrupt. And so seeking transformation while actually building power that allows you to do that. And I think, um, I'm curious, and I think y'all have answered this in some ways, like how do we keep on doing that? Because I think very often the kind of request at least of the different kind of establishment is that you engage in the inside of their rules in ways that actually builds their power and not power towards transformation. And so I think y'all kind of touched on this, but curious if there are other ways that we can make sure that as we're building power, as we're engaging the system, as we're ensuring kind of the ability of our people to survive inside of these real threats, um, how we're doing that in a way that isn't legitimizing and maybe is even calling out the illegitimacy of these systems. Um, and curious if folks have thoughts on that, but just really also, I think the ways you all have organized have for me been a beacon to kind of understand how to do that in a more real way. I mean, I think that, I think this is a critical question, especially as folks are like wrapping up 2020 and moving into 2021. So I appreciate the opportunity, oh. Mombre. I mean, I think one is like, Folks need to get real about their positionality on the playing field that is the question of democratic governance in this country. Like is you is or is you ain't on the outside part of the strategy and is you is or is you ain't on the inside part of the strategy. Not saying that one side of the, the strategy is better or more like cool kids club than the other but just to be real about then what your accountability looks like based on your positionality. So for example, if I am very clearly on the outside strategy team, 
right? Then that means there are certain things that I do not do or, or I would actually be on the inside, right? You can't, there's no, again, there's no neutrality. There is no center. You're either on the outside or you're on the inside. You ain't, there's no middle ground, right? If I'm on the inside strategy, then that means that there are very particular people that I have to be accountable to if what I'm trying to do is use this infrastructure for the sake of harm reduction, right? So I think, I think one is just like, know your role and play it excellently is the first thing that I would say. And I think the second thing that I would say is that like, we need to be able to practice governance. Like, and when I say governance, I don't just mean like being a part of the government, right? I mean, literally practicing self-determination, right? So one of the ways that some of our communities are practicing that is running candidates, right? I think about the Black Campaign School and like all these incredible pieces of infrastructure that are training people up that are not like Democratic Party ops, right? Uh, to, that are that actually the Democratic Party would never ever support. In fact, would say that they are not viable candidates, right? All the folks that are that are running for office and practicing governance through the system that that we've inherited, right? One that is not broken, but working exactly as it was designed to disenfranchise our people, right? There's a time and a place for that, right? But there's also incredible work that's happening through people's movement assemblies, like in Jackson or the Southern Movement Assembly. Uh, that's happening across the region in the South that is actually giving people the opportunity in geographies, like different geographic locations and across movements to practice what it is to self-determine, to, to do participatory budgeting, to like figure out what they want to build, what the rules of engagement are when harm happens in their communities. I think about the harm-free zone work that's happening in Durham, North Carolina, for example, that Spirit House has been leading. So I think there's there's like there's a, a reckoning to be had about what it means to like use what infrastructure exists for harm reduction, but also to build the alternative so that we're not in a codependent relationship with the state, right? Liberation for me doesn't look like my people just being dependent on this state as it exists. And I think that's what like Tenjiwe was speaking so eloquently about in regards to like actually talking about capitalism and the state, the economy and the state and what it looks like to build and practice the alternatives. And, I think the last thing that I would say, because it's easy to be like finger wagging at the state and finger wagging at the capitalist, right? But what I'd also say is that even those of us that are do-gooders and have committed our lives to social justice, that there's also a commitment that we need to make that's not just about how we target the state and, and target the economy to dismantle it and build what we want. There's also some real reckoning that we need to have internally about how we then talk and position ourselves in relationship to regular everyday people that are not organized, right? For example, I can't tell you, I mean, I'm, let, let's, let's not talk about us, let's talk about those other do-gooders, right? All those other do-gooders that you've heard say like, man, it's really annoying that those millions of people voted against their best interest. Have you heard people say that? Not you, but like other people say that, have you heard it? I definitely have. I've heard people call the region that I'm from Trump country, but guess where Trump is from? Queens, right? Guess where Ronald Reagan is from? California. Guess who the South gave you? Stacey Abrams and Jimmy Carter, right? Like, and I'm not saying they're everything, right? But I'm just saying that the, that Reaganomic shit and that Trumpism shit, we didn't do that, right? But what we've done is we've created like some movement ego shit <laughs> that makes it seem like we know better what's good for working class people in places that we've never even been and would never dare visit, right? When actually what has happened is we've conceded those territories to the right, right? And so the right actually knows what those people think their best interests are better than you do, right? And so instead of making those assumptions, I think we need to make a commitment to actually investing in conversations and pla places where people are already leading social movements and that are changing the conditions of those people and encouraging them and creating senses of belonging for them so that by the time we get to the midterms, we're not having the same conversation we were having last time. I think that's gonna be critical for our continued success. You get in the amens, you get in the head nods, you get in the pluses, you get in all the things. Thank you for breaking that down, um, Ash. I think it's really important. Do other folks wanna to add to this kind of idea like how we're building power and also the lessons learned from this year? I do wanna, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Tanjua. You know, you go, Tracy, I'll go after you. Um, just really quickly, I do want to say that it's also for organizers like me who like work at an organization to remember that the only reason that people invite me to the table is because folks are in the streets. And so there's a reason and there's a way that we don't um, stand in the way of 
progress because we have a congressperson who will answer our calls or because we have a relationship with an inside staffer um, that we don't diminish the movement in the streets because we think we're on the inside. Inside outside games require us to be accountable to each other. And if we're not the left flank, that's okay. We shouldn't be undermining the left flank and we shouldn't be in the way of the left flank. And so I think that's really important. And then I think organizing around an agenda is important. So I worked at an organization in Oakland um, called Oakland Rising, and they had an agenda that people knew what they were about. They're anti-capitalist, they are transformative justice. And so when they show up to people's doors, they have a trusting relationship with people that, that, who are voting. And so if I say, I'm from Oakland Rising, you should vote for this prop, People understand this probably ain't getting me free, but it's part of the larger um, thing that we're looking for. If I say you should vote for this candidate, it's part of the larger movement that we're moving towards. And so those things are both really important to me when I think about organizing um, in this kind of administration and beyond. It's hard talking after Ash and Tracy because <laughs> y'all be getting me a little too high. I mean, I had to. I had so many comments around what Tracy said around defund and then, but to this question around electoral organizing while not um, not uh, legitimizing the establishment, I think it's important. And, and I, as someone who, who has grew up as a young organizer who wrestled with in, engaging electoral organizing, that question really resonates with me, especially when it comes to like presidential elections or federal elections at the federal level, less at the local. I think, I think it's really important, but I, I think what this moment has made really clear is just the, um, the seriousness that we need to have around um, a few things. One is a clear vision and a multi-decade strategy um, and uh, understanding that we can, we have to one, some of these are harm mitigation tactics. I sometimes look at electoral organizing as harm mitigation tactics, coupled with benchmarks to change rules and gain more power over resources towards a long-term vision of structural change. And I think whenever we're, we're, we're wrestling and we're getting confused, I'm always reminded that um, you know, we can't shape strategies in a way in which is, is sort of um, controlled by, you know, I, I used to say before that, like, because of the hyper-professionalization of the left, we think about timelines based on grant cycles and not around sort of the decades and time it takes for actual structural change to occur. And so that we don't always feel our benchmarks or our, how we're walking towards structural change. So I, I, I think about, about it that way um, in terms of elect, engaging electoral organizing and power building. And then the other piece about how to do that um, in mass, the other thing I feel like that we need to uh, rid ourselves of, of the left as part of like sort of the hyper-professionalization or like campaign centeredness of the left is this idea that our people can't hold nuance, that we need over simplistic campaigns or slogans that actually don't clarify what we're saying, what we want or what our people need. Um, and I think this moment really exposed that that, um, that undermines our ability to build power. It also undermines our ability to, to have short-term gains that we can talk about that we are trying to, we're not voting for a candidate, we're voting for conditions. And we're very clear that, that this two-party this two party system and the ways in which um, uh, this government is structured does not work in the interests of our people that we can actually talk about and need um, to talk about both, both at the same time. Yes, I love this kind of not conditions and also um, embracing our people's ability to have nuance. Um, thank you all for that. That was amazing and juicy and all the things. Um, I want to, I think I have one more question before I want to open it up a bit um, to kind of focus on the call. Um, maybe two more questions. So we'll see what happens. But I think one question for sure, you know, we, we talked about what abolition democracy kind of meant according to the boys and this idea that it really is a restructuring of every single political, economic and social relationship. And so I'm curious um, if you can talk about kind of the work that you're doing both domestically, but also internationally to shift these relationships. Like how do you see your organizing whether it's electoral organizing, power building, the, those things together, how are they shifting relationships in kind of fundamental ways that might take us towards this kind of horizon of abolitionist democracy? And it's a free for all, so whoever feels moved to go first. Um, I can go, um, although I will note that if it's hard to go after Ashley and Tracy, it's even harder to go after Ashley, Tracy, and Tenji. Um, and of course, I'm not too. Um, but 
Uh, one, I guess, thing that came up, I know, is uh, the idea and the vision of participatory democracy. And I think that is something um, that's both very exciting and 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 very um, sort of uh, something for us to think about and think about how to scale up. Um, so, you know, in a couple of ways, like Trent, uh, participatory democracy really does help, I think, in some ways address the structural challenges and um, restrictions on our democracy, on an anti-Black democracy in particular, in that it creates space for, um, you know, communities and people um, to participate, right, in, in these systems that they have for far too long, in far too many ways, been both expressly and sort of Im implicitly um, rejected from or 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 been denied access to um, so you know a couple of different projects I know that's happening both you know really all around the country but you're seeing it locally in you know cities in Durham and in uh, New York City um, several other places around participatory budgeting projects for example where um, you know people in a community are allowed to vote uh, directly on a pool of money and the ways that they want to see it spent in their neighborhoods. Um, and that's not restricted to people who are, you know, filled out a voter registration or who are um, citizens or who are necessarily of a certain age or who, you know, haven't had contact with the criminal legal system in some way. Um, and so the idea, I think, of experimentation is critical for our um, advancing of an abolitionist democracy, right? Because we know that the system as it exists in the ways that, um, you know, have been laid out, our, our federal, you know, our federal government, our state governments, our local governments are not going to allow for the kind of radical sort of experimentation and um, development that we really need. And so I think uh, participatory democracy is, is, is a critical one. Um, and, you know, there are other aspects to participatory democracy beyond budgeting that I think are, are interesting, exciting. You know, one project that many of us have been engaged on um, over the last couple of years is to, in a way, to bridge like this, um, you know, structural beast of like the federal government and its, um, you know, entrenched elite and, and anti-Black um, kind of um, uh, uh, practice and um, orientation um, to really allow for communities harmed um, and held down and oppressed by federal policy to be able to surface those harms and actually offer the solutions to how we should be uh, advancing, uh, whether it's public safety or investments in housing or um, infrastructure. And so, um, you know, I think uh, there are ways that we, we, we can and communities have long been doing this, um, but I think part of our, maybe our, um, you know, uh, hopes here or, or, or focus in some ways can be around um, offering space for experimentation and, and trying to kind of link that to some of the insider entrenchment. Um, we've been able to, you know, as an example, um, just quickly um, with this idea to bring participatory democracy and participatory policy making to federal legislation, we're able to work with an ally like a representative Ayanna Presley uh, a couple years ago to actually advance a congressional resolution around the people's justice guarantee that actually calls on Congress to not only in that case dismantle the 1994 crime bill, which is what the campaign was focused on, but to actually do that in a way um, that's grounded in a participatory people's process. So literally a congressional resolution calling on Congress to follow the lead of communities impacted by mass criminalization, mass incarceration. So, um, you know, I think there are ways we can begin to bridge these, um, this, this sort of entrenched divide, but um, it's going to require, uh, you know, you hear this a lot, but, you know, space, space to experiment, space to, to fail, um, and space to build from that. Thank you for that, Kumar. I also put a link to the amazing work that LPBL and uh, a lot of other folks are holding on the people's process that you just referred to. Amna, give it to us. 
Yeah, so I wanted to build on what Kumar was saying because I think um, you know the framework for the conversation was about the anti-blackness of US democracy and building towards abolition democracy. And I think so many of the demands that are coming out of today's movements, including the movement for Black Lives ecosystem, but the left more broadly, are kind of these demands that you could properly understand, I think, as demands for an abolition democracy, for remaking the political, economic, and social structures of the country to demolish prisons, police, and jails, and to build you know, schools, uh, public transportation, um, healthcare for all, and so on and so forth. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about this because I, I, I don't know how many people on here are lawyers, but to the extent this is law for Black lives, like it might be useful a little, I thought it might be useful to think a little bit about some of the framework for those demands. Um, and so, and, and to say like, you know, like reform or demands that are coming out of movements are like everyone has been saying one part of many different strategies and tactics that are necessary to um, build abolition democracy to transform our political, economic and social relations. And so that includes things that like mutual aid and building alternate institutions, solidarity economies, transformative justice circles and so, so forth. And it's also important I wanna say that when we talk about demands and reforms, we're not just like building off what Tenji was saying at the beginning, we're not just talking about demands on the state. We're also talking about other places. This is the thing that law kind of obscures is that other there are other places where concentrated power lives and where people are making demands. And so that includes universities and schools, right? So like the cops out of schools campaigns that includes against workplaces, right? So strikes by labor and demands for whether it's PPE, time off, et cetera, um, and against corporations that are killing the environment. So here you can think about no dapple and standing rock and that sort of thing. And so you're seeing kind of this grassroots insurgency against all of the different ways that power is kind of concentrated by the state and by the capitalist class. Okay, so kind of keeping that in mind, like. I know a lot of times um, I wanted to talk about the idea of the non-reformist reform, which, which I think most people these days are familiar with as in the beautiful and really powerful ways that um, critical resistance um, and Ruth Wilson Gilmore and other abolitionist organizers have talked about and taught us, right? So it's about demands that dismantle, defund, delegitimize um, prisons and police to work us towards that abolition democracy. Um, so they're both about building down and then also about or tearing down and they're also about what do we need to build. Um, but, I, but I think it's important, be, especially because now in our movements, we're seeing a continuing kind of growth and integration of anti-racist and anti-capitalist critique to also think about the non-reformist reform framework that's kind of developed in the socialist tradition, which I know that the abolitionist tradition is also, of course, intertwined with including because Du Bois was a mar Marxist, but I just want to pause on it for a second because I think these, there are some distinctions here that are kind of worth thinking about that I know people in movement spaces are struggling with, right? And so because the abolitionist framework for non-reformist reforms is focused on the problem being the PIC, right? The prison industrial complex and the solution being abolition democracy, the focus is on kind of PIC as the target for the thing to break down and abolition democracy as a thing to build. Um, and in the socialist kind of tradition, it's more squarely focused on the thing to undermine is capitalism and the thing to build up is socialism. And again, I don't mean to like separate these things out. The PIC is very much an expression of capitalism and vice versa and abolition democracy in my view. And I think is a fair reading of Du Bois as a socialist society. Um, but just to say, I think it's important to think about because I think you know, like targeting prisons and police doesn't always have to be actually anti-capitalist. And I think there's a lot of kind of thinking that we need to do about when we make our demands and build our campaigns, how we're kind of both thinking about all of those things at once, um, or less kind of keeping that in view. Um, and so the last thing I just wanted to say really quickly is like, I do think it's a really exciting time where I, where I think across the left mo movement ecosystem, people are making these demands for these more, like a, like um, not democracy in terms of voting for the president, but democracy in terms of, I have a say so over what my community looks like, where our wealth is going, like what we're building, what we're taking down, um, even, you know, kind of like decolonizing the land and have, you know, building a completely different relationship with the earth. So whether you think of movement for black lives, the Red Nation, the Democratic Socialists of America, Sunrise Movement, Mejente, um, and including the stuff that Gamar was talking about in terms of solidarity budgets and participatory budgeting, all of this stuff is like really important kind of demand for that kind of say so over, you know, our everyday lives. Um, and I agree with Tenji that things don't need to get too complicated, but I also want to pull back something that I think Ashley was saying before, that one of the really powerful things about these demands is they make clear 
that policy that meets the needs of everyday people doesn't need to be that complicated, right? Like people's needs right now, it's really clear under COVID, are pretty basic. And how to solve the crisis of houselessness, food insecurity, um, police violence is pretty simple. And our movements are telling us defund the police, invest in, uh, how, you know, build guaranteed housing. And so I think they're also really beautiful and provide a, you know, kind of like a, um, a big umbrella under which to build that united front that Ashley was talking about. Yes, gems. This idea of democracy with a little d as collective self determination just feels so powerful. Like something to something really juicy to chew on. Of like we don't mean the institutions that were created to kind of sustain white power. We actually mean self determination in a collective sense. So yes, yes, yes. Um, beautiful. Ashley, Tracy, Tenjiwe, y'all's thoughts on this, um, both in the domestic and international context, would love to hear. I can jump in. I, you, Tenji could feel me looking at her because she's she's the person that I go to for all things international. But I mean, I think a couple of thoughts. I think that I think that like we have a lot to learn from international comrades and a lot to share. I think like if I've learned anything with the movement for Black Lives, it's that you know we've built something pretty special in the U.S. Um, that folks are like really inspired by, and we also have a whole lot of privilege and a whole lot of blind spots that. Uh, that become really obvious when we're in international spaces with our comrades. I think the big thing for me in terms of like, their, internationalism is a practice too, right? It's not just something that I say that I don't actually get, have to like build relationships with people to actually in, in, be accountable and interact with. But I think that that if I was if I was parsing it apart, I would say part of the big thing that we've le I learned since 2019 in particular is that the right is like, regardless of whether or not I build an, a, a pan-African or an internationalist politic and practice, the right certainly is, right? Like white supremacist organizations, paramilitary forces, et cetera, are being trained by like actual Nazis in Europe, right? But let's, let's not even talk about them. Let's not talk about the fact that they're getting resources to, to purchase arms by the billions, right? Let, let's let's talk about the elected since what we wanted to talk about was electoral stuff, right? Let's let's talk about the fact that Marsha Blackburn is literally meeting with Australian Nazis publicly, overtly, right? They are building a global relationship and global infrastructure, right? It's not by happenstance that fascism started to not even started, but like creeped up even more than it already has been in this country under a Trump administration while also we're seeing fascist and authoritarian, uh, you know, rising globally, right? Whether it's Brazil or like many other places, right? So I think that there's, there's, if, if we're, if we believe that a concrete assessment of concrete conditions should influence our strategies, and not that we want to replicate our enemies, but that we do want to know what they're up to, they are certainly building a, a global movement um, to, to support to support to support their their fascist tendencies and authoritarian politics happening everywhere right so why wouldn't we like if we actually want to win then we we certainly have to and I think that there's some things that we've learned that feel important to to, to think about as we move towards our abolitionist freedom dreams right it's like abolition is both a process and a destination right but what's also real is that along that process to get to that 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 destination, there's some things that I would want along the way, right? I would want, back to Tracy's like original point, is I would want them to name what happened. I'd want truth, right? And then I'd want justice for what happened, right? And then all of that would have to happen plus abolition for me to get to a place of being able to reconcile all of the contradictions of this country and what it means to be in my particular bodysuit in this place, right? Um, and I don't think that we would have come to that understanding had it not been for an internationalist relationship with like comrades in South Africa, right? I think that that it is clear to me that like without without a not only like a politic around it, but a praxis around it that is not new to our social movements, right? Black people in particular, working class people have been building these relationships for, for generations. Without that, we don't win. I, I think it's really, really simple that if it hadn't been from some of the lessons that we learned from international comrades, I don't know that we would have had the good sense to build the kind of united fronts that were required of us to be able to, to get Trump out of office. 
Ashby. I just love hearing Ash speak. That's basically <laughs> why I be quiet. Um, I'll just say a couple of things. Um, one around the global piece and then two around, you know, the, I think, I think that the heart of our problem is racial capitalism. And I often think about what would make racial capitalism fall. So, and, and you know, I, I think like others depart from Marx um, theory that uh, capitalism um, will fall inevitably um, following the uh, a, wor a, a revolution of the working class. Even though I'm a, I am a discipline optimist, I think that there are things that are, are not, I don't, you know, I think there are things that are, that are not inevitable. Um, I just wanna say one thing about sort of uh, rate, just sort of like, at the end of the day, we're talking about rules and resources and who controls it, right? And, and so that's at the heart of it. And I feel like as an organizer, I think about um, how to shift who controls resources and rules so that it goes from um, a consolidation of a few to an actual democracy, true democracy, which is, um, uh, you know, to be People, people essentially rule their own lives. It's self-determination, it's equity, and it's challenging oppressive um, relations. So, and I think about that often. Um, and, and, and I think that there are a few things um, that make that real. One, obviously, I think there, there, there will no be no radical realignment of power without a global movement and a global struggle that is aligned around a dominant narrative around an alternative vision that is not easily co-optable, that is about challenging um, capitalism, that is talking about an alternative economy, that is talking about a different way to govern, um, and that is the dominant narrative with masses of people. And I also believe that global movement needs to practice, as Ash said before, needs to practice some of these things internally. So like we can't fight for democracy externally if we don't practice radical democracy internally. And so we need to figure out how are we practicing governance through radical democracy, which we often think is, is not necessary as we go into organizations and we engage into sort of this sort of hyper-professionalization of being in movement relationship to each other. But actually, if we look at the Zapatistas, if we look at around the world, one of the fundamental characteristics of success is the ability to, to practice some of the values and demands internally. Um, so, so, so the piece, piece around radical democracy and obviously also reckoning with anti-Blackness. We can't fight for anti-Blackness um, uh, and anti-Blackness in the world if our, if our multiracial broad global movements are replicating and racist, sexist, transphobic ideology. It just continues to rip us apart and we won't be able to be sort of the, the force that we can be. And also like, you know, I feel like our ancestors were dreaming of us to build sort of the kind of united front global movement that we're supposed to. And so we, we need to, we need to um, really, really reckon and, and um, deal with that both internally, but, but to exert it. Um, uh, uh, internally, but exerted, um, externally. And the other thing I think is, you know, in thinking about just this moment, we have to figure out how do we, the mass disruption and inability to like, to, to have control over us to instill order um, uh, so that in moments where capitalism has forced us into crisis, the market isn't saved while the economy is struggling and people are harming. We have to figure out a way to interrupt the state from continuing to save capitalism. And I think the only way we do that when capitalism does force us into another crisis is to have a, a, a global mass movement with a dominant narrative that will not be controlled or put into order um, when we are in moments of crisis and we're ready to demand that the state not rescue corporations, not rescue the market, but actually, um, actually put in place the beginnings of an alternative economy. So sharp, yes. Thank you for that, Tenji Wei. Tracy, do you want to add anything to that? Or just generally? Oh, on point. <laughs> on point. Um, so I just wanted to add some things that I hadn't added before. Um, so one, when I think about democracy, I think about like the ways that we work together, but I also think about democratizing our skills. Um, and so not hoarding them, making sure that what I know, you know. And I think that goes back to what Tenji Wei was saying about um, our people are complex and can handle like this, the, the intersection, na intersectional nature of the work that we do. Um, and people are interested in, in getting it done and working with working with us and like building it themselves. And so it's about humbling yourself because when you go into conversations, we don't hold all that information, our people do. Um, the other thing I think is like telling this like larger story about fascism 
even though you know Trump was defeated, that does not mean fascism is gone. That just means that we kind of held it back for maybe two years, four years, possibly. Um, he's already talking about running in 2024. There was a letter that went out from folks. Um, I think it was like 118 Republicans um, joined with Texas to like try to overturn this election. So there were a lot of people who were like, "Oh, you know, ignore this like attempt at a coup." And I get not wanting to. Um, get people really upset about it because it maybe won't work, but it definitely is like testing um, the constraints of what we say this like democracy is. Um, the other thing is I, I'm gonna drop this thing that um, my organization did. We have this, we have this project called Crescendo um, and they specifically did some work about how Trump is really similar to Modi, uh, who's the prime minister of India. And there's also, um, you know, like it, he's not different than the prime minister of Britain. So when we look at Brexit, like these things are happening in concert. And so if the right and fascism is happening in concert, we for sure better be trying to have work in concert as well because we cannot win individual if they're coming at us united. Um, and then the final thing that has nothing to do with this, but I saw it in the chat. Uh, so I just have to say it again. Somebody asked about how this intersects with like uh, how abolition intersects with like social work or social service Services. And I am an abolitionist who believes that all cops with a conscience should quit their job. And that's why I quit being a social worker. And so I'm always happy to talk more about that offline. Thank you so much, Tracy. And we have about, I think, 12 more minutes. So I'm super excited to move to some of the kind of gems in the chat, but just want to thank you all for the brilliance. Two things that came up for me that I just have to say is number one, this kind of pro-democracy movement that many of y'all are leading, but this idea that like the road to fascism is not a single election, whether it's Hitler, whether it's Mussolini, that none of that ever happened in one four year period, but really that like really the, the land is being primed for fascism right now. And so I think the work that each of y'all involved in to build power and also pro-democracy and redefine democracy is so essential because we are creeping towards and we are seeing the normalization of fascism right now. And so the strength of real democratic in the like the sense of kind of self-determination democratic institutions are so important. I also just want to say and shout out reparations, which has come up in all the ways from all the people on this panel. Of there's no way to move forward without looking back. And so what would a reparations package for democracy look like or mean? Um, and I'm going to drop an M4BL resource around like the full possibilities of reparations. But I want to thank you all for bringing in how do we name and address and assess and repair harms in a real way. So and those two questions I saw that I want to just bring up um, and popcorn, but also want to invite everyone else who has questions to, to share that in the chat. And um, the first question was, um, and this is from Ayana, which was around, what do you all feel is the biggest barrier, whether it's law or public perception, to moving towards abolition? Um, and that's kind of the full economic governance sense of self-abolition that we've been talking about tonight. So what are the biggest barriers that y'all are seeing um, is the first question. I'm going to give y'all two to to think about and to chew on. The other one, and I don't remember who it was from, was about kind of solutions. And so one of the, um, the recommendations of abolishing state senates as a way to get towards kind of more democracy in the sense of, of a true definition. And so curious, based on that question, what are some other ideas y'all have? Or what are the structural barriers um, that we're seeing to, to democracy that would allow for self-determination? So whether it's the electoral college, whether it's senate, where are the kind of the state of those initiatives that you're seeing? So those are the two questions we got so far I'll let y'all answer them. And again, if other folks have questions, curiosities, please put it in the chat. Um, I could start with the the bear, some of my thoughts around the barriers. Um, and I think it was a ba barriers to abolition, right? Uh, you know, I think uh, obviously it's 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 hard to pinpoint one thing. I think that uh, what really is happening is a, um, a a deep relationship to multiple different things that um, make you know advocacy around abolition a reality. Although I do think we're watching some things um, break open. The piece around public perception is important, but but I, I really feel like what it is it's it's the machine of the right and the center that feeds and stokes fears, and also they get to control and define what's normal. Um, and what is abnormal or um, what is not possible in, in terms of like um, uh, uh, public perception. And, and I, I really feel like it's our responsibility um, as folks on the left to uh, not just challenge, um, challenge these like problematic norms, but also um, 
you know, challenge sort of the, the stoking of fear, the, the, the sort of like, really what it is, is like the, the elimination of imagination and the sort of, um, what they're doing is telling people that you actually can't have what you deserve um, and distracting them with fear. And, and, I, and I think that that's our responsibility on the left to combat that and counter that. Um, but I think that we can't, we can't ignore the money, the resources, the power that this machine has to um, stoke and maintain th those ideas and those feelings. Um, I believe we're more powerful because I just think we are. <laughs> I think we got our ancestors at our back. So um, I think we can and we will. And I think more and more people are, are actually thinking about abolition um, and reimagine, like reimagining how, how society could be structured and also saying that they deserve to be safe too. You know, like that we can reimagine what safety in this country actually, what safety in this actually is and, and, and how to, um, how to structure safety for everybody. Thank you so much for that, Tenji Wei. Yeah, I mean, echoing Tenji, I think, I think other than the obvious, right, like capitalism and the state are big barriers to abolition. Um, I do think that our ability to talk to everyday people about what, what it is, like what would it look like to live in an abolitionist community, like a community that is living into abolition, we just don't, we don't spend as much time talking about it as we do debating about whether or not it's a process or a destination. You know, I, I feel like if I spent as much time in my neighborhood talking to my neighbors about what abolition could look like as I do on these panels, we might, we might be there already. And I think that like the, the, the second thing that I would say is I think this question of like, what is safety in the absence of policing is is a question that our people are going to consistently ask right like you know i've organized around abolishing the police for decades now and the grandmamas in the hoods that i organize in are like yo but like actually i want the police precinct over here if it'll make me safer right if it'll make me me my individual apartment if i am safer and i think we have to be able to like actually break it down and, and explain to people what like the, the the real ass answers to their questions around how we will keep them safe in the absence of these structures that that also don't keep them safe right like I think they get that it, that it doesn't really keep them safe and we don't have we need to build the alternative that's actually practicable right I think that that the role of people of goodwill in this moment is is multiple but I think it is absolutely our responsibility to make the absurd obvious, right? That like people are investing so much of their money into a system that is so obviously failing, right? Like, and make it clear. And like, to make it also really obvious how absurd it is to think that you couldn't be safe beyond policing when I bet if I asked you to close your eyes and think of a time where you were safe, you wouldn't see cops. <laughs> You wouldn't see prisons. You wouldn't see ICE agents. You wouldn't see like the, the the military and the Pentagon, right? Like if I asked you when you felt safe, you'd probably say like in the arms of your lover or holding your baby or with your mom and them or when you was dancing sweaty in the club with your homegirls. Like it would not be like when you were in handcuffs or you were seeing someone that harmed you with uh, surrounded by folks in blue uniforms. Like that just wouldn't be what it was. And, and I think that like, sometimes all too often we stop there when thinking about our responsibility to the answer of this question when i think there's actually another part of the sentence that's around making the alternative irresistible and impossible to say no to right like we will win abolition when the masses are like man that's it that's what i want i do want a world where like my neighbors don't have to be scared about cops shining lights in their apartments at one o'clock in the morning you know like when we actually make it irresistible and impossible to say no to our people our people will get it because again like like Tiji said I agree that they'll understand the nuance and I agree with what Amna said is that it's not actually that fucking complicated right um I think I think that's it for me um I think that we have to make it clear what what safety feels like and popularize what it could be when we reimagine what public safety can be I love that thank you Ashley and curious what folks thoughts are too about this question like what are the like not baby steps, what are the steps towards an abolitionist democracy in terms of the institution? So someone suggested like, is it that we get rid of state senates? Like what are other kind of steps we can take as we start to think about remaking democracy also in an abolitionist um, in image? We gotta get rid of preemption, y'all. Like, I, I think, I mean, you know, 
Miles Horton would say, like, if you asked me if I would say, if I would say I was a socialist, I'd be like, yeah, for right now. But once we get that, I might actually be to the left of that. Um, you know, I think that like, what we should like one of the like I think about all the incredible work that's happened in local communities all across the south whether it was fighting for living wages uh whether it was you know fighting uh for community control boards and all that kind of stuff like as soon as they won it they got the petitions say they, they got it on the ballots they won the initiatives you know again to your point these state houses and in, in the neo-confederacy shut it down right over and over and over again so we tell people and I, and I fear that going into 2021, because people, especially if we don't win these two seats in Georgia, what, what national organizations, particularly rooted in places that are not the South, are going to tell Southerners to do is go local. And then they're going to go local. They're going to spend lots of money, lots of money for us, which will be pennies to the dollar of what nonprofits and other places get, right? But we'll spend a little bit of money we got, which is a lot of money to us, on doing local work that will win, because we can do that. And then the state will shut that shit down. And so, you know, I think, is there a movement right now to abolish state houses? No, not really. Not really. There might be a couple of anarchists and commies out here that are saying they're doing it, but it's, we don't have a critical mass, right? But I think if we don't, and I feel like Marbury has been raising this question about preemption for as long as I've known you, like, if we don't really get serious about preemption, we're gonna tell people to engage in strategic interventions that actually in the in the tier, not even the 10 year, in the five year span, don't make a whole hell of a lot of sense. Ashe, and this is an open invitation. If there are lawyers or legal workers who wanna think about preemption, please hit us up because I feel like we are on assignment from Ash and the people. Um, other folks on this question of kind of what are some of the, the institutions that people are trying to fight against. And there's also a question um, in the chat about working with elected officials um, and what is kind of the math um, around that and, and how folks engage them. Um, so I would say in addition to preemption, I would, I mean, in my dream, like we wouldn't, we'd abolish the Supreme Court too. Like all of these things are like extremely undemocratic. And so there hasn't been like these large scale movements again, because we're trying to figure out what we can win and not what we want. So it's like the Senate is ridiculous. The Supreme Court is ridiculous. And so like, we should do away with both of those things. I'd also say one of the big barriers to abolition is that we expect the other side of it to be a utopia and that's not fair. Like we currently have literal bread lines. And so you can't tell me that the alternative I hand out to you or the alternative that we dream up together has to be perfection. That's not uh, realistic and it's not fair. And, and I don't think that we should uh, ground our ideas of what is on the other side in that. Um, I'm, like, I'm trying to have different problems and that's how I talk about it. Um, and so, you know, that I think that's big. And then I think the idea of like working with elected officials, there are people who um, I think are really great. Ayanna Presley is one of them, but that does not mean that Ayanna and all these other people who we really like are not trying to navigate anti-Black systems. And so it's about accountability. It's about calling in when necessary and calling out when necessary. So we should be working with them. We should be building allyship, but that allyship does not look like we have like some fidelity to them where we never criticize them. Um, the, the goal is accountability, not perfection. And we should like talk about that and we should figure out ways and systems to hold people accountable. 10,000%. And it's like, who's the we? Like, I'm not saying you have to work with elected officials, right? Like, again, know your role and play it. Some of y'all might not ever work with elected officials. That might be fine, right? But that doesn't mean that in our multi-tactical strategy that somebody shouldn't be engaging with elected officials. I think the problem that we inherited from 20, 20th century social movements is this idea that like, you can only be cool if you engage in this one kind of tactic. And that's just not real. That's not that's not going to work in a 21st century context. I love it. I love it. And there's so much juicy stuff happening also in the chat, which I think we'll share. So I am so, so sad that we are out of time. It is 8.30 Eastern. Um, but this has been such an incredible conversation. A few quick things. One is I went ahead and forgot to give people's bios because I was so excited about this conversation. But there will be a link um, on our website along with this recording that will allow you to go. And y'all should Google folks anyway, but we'll have an official bio of all the dope panelists we had. Also, there has been gems and juice and all the things in 
the chat box. We will also have that on our website under resources for folks. And I want to just really thank y'all. I think that this is a really important conversation and, and the ways y'all have brought both your organizing, your intellect, and kind of the sharpness with which you guys move um, has been absolutely incredible. And we are so, so grateful. So thank you. Um, and I hope everyone goes into the end of this year and and fortifies. <laughs> we survive. So mad love um, to everyone. And thank you again for being part of this conversation. Bye.